Okay. So the goal of, um, the first question is the goal of medical therapy in ulcerative colitis is to induce remission, maintain remission, enhance quality of life, and minimize complications of the disease in its therapy. Surgery has a role in laparoscopic surgery is placing open surgery in many IBD centers. The common indications for surgery are, as you see, Good. Yeah, we would agree with that. Um, next question, please. Total proctorectomy with uh, uh, ileal patch anal anastomosis, pouch and anal anastomosis, or standard ileostomy, is a procedure choice for patient needing surgery for ulcerative colitis. Uh, multiple, well, I'm not sure about that, but uh, at least in certain situations. Multiple studies have demonstrated the following except for, to choose one. except for short order. Yeah, we agree with that. Everybody agree with that? Everybody agrees with that. Okay, next question. The etiology of occasional fecal incontinence following a pull-through operation for ulcerative colitis is likely due to, there you go, see how good the memory is, uh, hypermotive, well, I won't tell you what it is. Oh, I don't think they were, people were listening, or maybe they thought there was all, th all three. Loss of anal canal, is that would be the right one? Well, it's not, it's, it's not, it's not that, it's on, can you hear me? You can, can we turn on the microphone? It's not, not really that fair of a question because I think all three answers are correct, but in a, in a patient in whom the anal canal has been preserved and the sphincter is preserved, which we hope is all of our cases, but it's not, it's certainly not all, but certainly hopeful, uh, then it's hypermotility in my view. Okay, so we have a couple of, a question from, uh, I'm not sure where it's coming from, but it's over the internet. Uh, and I think it's directed to Dr. Wexner. It's a uh, question is, why is your preference in this video to mobilize the right ureter? No, I didn't, I didn't mobilize the right ureter. I, I'm not sure what they mean by that. I was demonstrating where it was, but I by no means mobilized it. There was one point when we were looking at the left nerve coming down past the sacral promontory, and maybe that's what they're referring to, and that was an error. We went a little bit lateral to the nerve, then realized where it was and came back medial, but not the ureter. Okay, so for our friends down south, he did not mobilize. He was just sort of demonstrating. Uh, I think we all agree that uh, you don't want to mobilize the ureter at all because it has a segmental blood supply. And if you mobilize too much, you can knock off the blood supply. So not a good idea. Uh, no, to, I mean, to for the purpose of a teaching video, we wanted to very clearly demonstrate its position, but that's it. Definitely not mobilize it. Okay, well, you got a counter, you got another question here. Uh, not, it's not, it was directed at you, but it could be for anybody. And that is, how often, if ever, do you use lighted ureteral stents? Uh, never. Uh, I, I use stents fairly liberally if somebody has a big phlegmon in the pelvis, if somebody's been radiated with a leaked anastomosis. I mean, anywhere I anticipate a problem, left or right, but never lighted ones, just standard ones. How does everybody else feel about that? Pretty much the same. I haven't used the lighted, ins lighted ones in the same indication, selective use of stents. I, uh, you can feel the regular stents with the laparoscopic instrument. I, I'm not sure that lighted ones add anything. Okay, so nobody's using it. Mark, ever in the kit, in the kit, do they make them small enough? Do you ever use, as a, in a pediatric case, do you ever use ureteral stents? We do. There's a, there's a really neat uh, infrared product that lights up only with certain, with the laparoscope on. And we've used it in certain circumstances, like for repair of an anorectal malformation, when you want to see the urethra where the rectum and the urethra are in communication congenitally, but not in this, uh, not in this condition. There's a question in the back. Professor Lorenzi, Cleveland Thank Clinic, you. Ohio. I have two points to make and a two questions to ask to the panel. One thing that regarding the infertility that we're talking about, holding on the surgery until the childbearing age passes. I do have a concern that the studies that 
is out there is being used against the surgery, where you can always do a total abdominal colectomy if the patient is sick enough and do the pouch later on. Plus, infertility means getting harder, harder to get pregnant. It doesn't mean that they cannot get pregnant. So they can always get pregnant most of the to time and the end. So that's one point, and the question is, what is the panel surgeon's opinion, whether they use fertility as a reason not to operate on someone? And the second point that I would like to make regarding the use of the Remicade, where, where the surgeons stand in the usage of the Remicade on these patients. We have a new study that's coming out on the ASCRS from Ohio that over 100 patients, significantly much higher complication related to surgery and the necessity of a three-stage on these patients. Thank you. May I take the fertility one? I think the, uh, certainly the Scandinavian countries have some very good data showing that the fecundity or the ability to become pregnant is reduced in patients who've undergone surgery for ulcerative colitis. And in the GYN literature, the main cause of secondary infertility is because of adhesions in the pelvis. What we've been doing in our laparoscopic patients is using the similar model that was used in the seprafilm study. So at the time of closure of the ileostomy, we're going back in with the laparoscope through the ileostomy takedown incision. The vast majority of female patients after a laparoscopic proctocolectomy and J-pouch have no adhesions in the pelvis. So at this point, if I believe that I can do a procedure laparoscopically on a lady, I do not think that fertility is going to be impacted. Mark, you had a comment? Yeah, I have, I have a very similar experience, and, and, uh, and I, I also think that it, uh, comment that Dr. Young Fedak made during this talk is that we uh, why let, allow a patient to stay sick all that time uh, when we do have an operation that is safe. Um, so. oh, it, it was definitely not my intention to say that a, ch a patient should remain sick. There are situations where you can wait. I, I think if you review the literature carefully, which I had the opportunity to do for this talk, I can tell you that literature is quite poor on this subject. It's unclear whether it's the disease or the operation itself that's leading to the infertility, obviously you have to treat the patient and the patient can't remain sick. Your point is well taken though, I think that if you have to take out the colon and wait on your pouch, that, ha that obviously gives you an additional, uh, additional option. Steve? I, yeah, I don't have anything different to say on the female aspect, but the other flip side you didn't ask about are males. And occasionally in young males, if there's a reasonable looking rectum, I would do an ileorectal once in a while. Um, the chance of nerve injury is small, but it's not zero. And there have been some instances where I've said, yeah, the rectum's really pretty good. Even though it's ulcerative colitis, if you need a pouch later, you know, at least we'll give you that one benefit. People have asked, um, which is an interesting thing that's somewhat less discussed than fertility in women. Why does everybody show their video with females? Is it any reason that it's easier case? They yes. want to it's, comment it's the, about that? It's the proverbial skinny woman on the inside. They're, they're easier to demonstrate. Anybody, anybody have any videos of males? Yeah. How come we never show them? <laughs> Rector urethral fistula videos. <laughs> Thanks, Ed. Stephen White from Australia again. Uh, comments to all of the surgeons uh, about the, um, the exhaustive time that this operation takes. Um, there's, in terms of the colonic mobilization, um, there's no single instrument that can both divide all the peritoneum, all the other structures, and deal with the vessels. So I was a, I was a little disappointed to see a lot of reusable instruments, um, endoseals, um, uh, ligatures, um, even disposable scissors, to deal with the peritoneal reflection. Um, I think there's cost and time. I think a simple, reusable diathermy can mobilize the whole colon quite adequately, and then how you deal with the vessels, you do have to, well, if you're doing it totally laparoscopically, you've got a staple. And I, I think there's evidence, sh I even in segmental colectomy, that diathermy is quicker than um, ligature or uh, harmonic. So in a total colectomy, I think that data's even stronger. The other comment is to do with the rectal mobilization. Now, I think our instruments there, uh, are really way behind what we're trying to do. I think the exposure of the pelvis, especially with a bulky uterus or a big prostate in the male, is very difficult at present. Um, that's why no one showed a video on a male. And uh, 
and our stapling of the um, bare muscle tube is, as Tanya showed, it's very rare to get that in one firing. Um, uh, and I, I think there's, a, there, there's some huge gains yet to be made in, in that area. So your comments on just the speed of the whole operation. So anybody want to say why in a rich America we're using a lot of instrumentation? Is that in essence the question? Yeah, yeah that was we won. Well, I'd, I'd take your point with that. Um, the, we do use cautery to mobilize and they are reusable scissors. They just have a disposable tip so that they remain sharp. And then uh, uh, as you saw on the simplest form of the procedure, we don't use any sealing device intracorporeally because the entire mesenterian vessels are taken extracorporeally. That's about as cheap as you can get. Yeah, I, I use mostly cautery for my dissection, and I've combined, when I come across the omentum, I find that I still run into bleeders, and I prefer to have a vessel sealing device. I don't use a stapler uh, for my vessels intracorporeally when I divide them. I use this, a vessel sealing device, so I try to use one disposable instrument. And then, uh, as far as dividing the rectum, you've got to get a stapler out for something. You have to, unless you're doing a, a, a coloanal hand sewn anastomosis. Um, and you got to have a stapler out there for your pouch anyway. So what's one more reload? And I often use the uh, try to use the same staplers many times and try to uh, minimize the use of of bringing multiple staplers. And I usually just use my open staplers, except for the one where you got to come across the rectum. And I'll often use an open one through a through the as a hybrid approach, uh, or just that one portion of the, of the procedure, just a, the inexpensive TA stapler right down through a through the open incision. So I, we are very aware of cost. I try to. I really try to avoid the instrument exchange and multiple multiple uh, disposable instruments if we can. Could well, I just see a, a show of hands about who uses uh, ultrasonic energy for their dissection? Who uses bipolar energy? I'm not. I'm purposely not trying to name companies. Who uses bipolar sealing devices? Really? Only a few. For the wow. dissection or for the vessel? Vessels. For, for the vessels. vessels. For sealing yeah. vessels. vessels yeah. How many people use a mechanical device, a stapler, for vessels? Huh. Interesting. I think the, the, the one thing when you, you talk about cost that's, you know, on, on the one case basis may be true to use a, a monopolar current source, but there's another cost too, and there's a cost of time from the smoke plume from a monopolar source that is not as bad with either the ultrasonic energy variety or the bipolar source, and the time for taking the camera in and out and cleaning uh, is significant when you're looking at an operation that when you're pretty slick you can do in maybe three to four hours, and as we're seeing in the literature, six to eight. A lot of that time is, you know, a huge amount of smoke evacuation, camera cleaning. In our country, that's very, that is precious time. Uh, that's more expensive than going to eat in one of those nice restaurants in Bellagio. Um, in addition, there's the potential cost because the energy is not as precise, and the spray and the potential injury from a monopolar source has in many studies been shown to be not as safe as between the jaws of something, whether it's ultrasonic or, or bipolar or a stapler is immaterial. And the cost of an unrecognized injury is also much more significant. So I think I would argue the other way, that there's a cost advantage in using a precise energy source as opposed to a monopolar spray instrument or inadvertent spray instrument. Let me ask the panel a specific question. You have someone who has ulcerative colitis and needs an operation, long-standing disease, and has, has dysplasia in the rectum, not upstream, in the rectum. What do you do for that? What procedure do you do for that? What, low grade or high grade? What's the difference? Big difference. I, I don't mean, think and there's and a difference found, at all. No, is it found, and is it found on one single biopsy no, once no. or is it repeated? One or two, it doesn't really make any difference from my perspective. Well, there's dysplasia in the rectum. I'm talking about in the rectum, where you're near where you're either going to do a double stapler or whatever you're going to do. The only thing that would coax me to a mucosectomy would be a repeated finding of high-grade dysplasia in the distal third of the rectum. Short of that, I'm happy to do a double staple. Even with low-grade dysplasia? Absolutely, even with low-grade. And the logic that I would use for that is that Mayo Clinic, where they took out pouches in the early, well, the late 80s, from pouches done in the early to mid 80s, and they step sectioned them. In one in five cases, there are mucosal islands outside where the mucosectomy had been done. They can't be seen, they can't be accessed, they can't be biopsied. When you do double stapling, 
you can see what you left behind and you can sample it as often as you like and if necessary you can do a mucosectomy and a pouch advancement as needed down the road. Uh, and there have been more cases in the literature of cancer after mucosectomy than after double stapling. So I would say unless there's, you know, repeated high grade in the lowest part of the rectum, I'm happy to do double stapling. Yes, I think Steve makes a good point because if, if you if you actually look at the number of instances of cancer that's been reported after a pouch, if you take five or six feet of colon and rectum out and you leave someone with one to two centimeters of rectal mucosa, their risk of rectal cancer is less than the average person walking around on the street. I, 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 uh, I'm a little bit more nervous and it's, I know what the, uh, we're referring to these studies, but how many of those were patients that actually had the dysplasia at the first time? Um, this patient's clearly demonstrating that they're heading down a malignant pathway. I am not in a big institution. I'm a little bit more conservative and a little scared, um, and I will, I'll lean a little bit more to not low-grade dysplasia. I wouldn't do a, a mucosal proctectomy. High-grade dysplasia, as long as it's not a, what, what really looks like a sporadic adenoma, that, of course, is low-grade dysplasia. No, but if it's truly, I'm not talking about truly, that. yeah, I'm, but I don't do many of them. I mean, really, I would, uh, I do most, almost everything as a double staple. Doctor? Quick question. Dr. Rice from Jerusalem, Israel. I have a question to Dr. Young Fedok. Uh, it was a very nice video, but I was concerned a little bit about the length of the rectal stamp that remained. And I would uh, be interested to hear what are your results in, in terms of the mean length of it and what are your technical tips to make it as low as possible? Well, I think I, I mentioned while I was presenting that it looked as though there was a little cuff of rectum still um, while I was stapling across it, but that the rectum is under a lot of tension being pulled up while the stapling is being done. And as soon as the stapling was completed, and I pointed out how the staple line receded into the, the perineum so that that staple line is at the top of the anal canal, that we're not leaving any rectum there. Someone I guess my real question was, by the way, would you ever tell a patient with rectal dysplasia to not have a restorative proctoclectomy? <laughs> Are you not c concerned about recurrent cancer there Wait, to, in to, that group? To, to have a total proctoclectomy, you're saying? You mean do an APR? No, I'm talking about ulcerative colitis with rectal dysplasia. We know that those tend to be the ones who have the highest incidence of recurrent cancer outside the pouch that gets detected late. Do you ever not, do you ever have a patient who you just say, maybe it's better for you to have a, uh, would you do that in a rectal cancer, if there was a ulcerative colitis with a cancer there? It would depend what stage the uh, cancer is. If it's of such a stage that you think you're going to use um, uh, I'm going to tell you, it's not a big stage cancer because nobody's going to do a pull through with a big cancer there. So, but if you have a uh, mucosal lesion, maybe you know, an rectal ultrasound, it's and it's. If you've looks got an, an early stage cancer where you're not going to be delivering radiation to the anal sphincter and this patient's got a low risk of recurrence, um, it's still, there's still a risk of recurrence there, but it's still low. I wouldn't condemn that entire group to a permanent ileostomy. I'd give them a pouch. Yeah, I, Everybody I, agree with that? I agree. No, no, I agree. And I think that, you know, your indications for restorative resection with ulcerative colitis are the same as without ulcerative colitis. And if a lesion's low and, and you can go ahead and start at the dentate line and get a two centimeter margin and good circumferential margins, it is the same as whether they've got colitis or they don't have colitis, as long as you can get the reasonable margins on your cancer. Tonya's point about radiation is an important one, though. And in addition, if it comes down in a, in a lower third rectal cancer, you can sometimes do an interesting teric proctectomy. I would not be too keen to do an interesting teric proctectomy and then do an ileal pouch, whereas when I do a colonic pouch, it usually works out okay. No, I'm not talking about colonic pouch. I'm talking about in no, a UC patient. No, in a UC patient, I would not do an interesting teric. But anything short of that, I'd be happy to put them back together. I want to thank the panelists, the audience. I think we got a lot of information out of this, and it was terrific. Thank you so much.